magnificent piece of work. Mm. Hey, folks. Amen. Mel and I are really small, and I think the two of us could probably take this. <laughs> he, he wanted to take it. You might be better talking tonight, with all due respect. <laughs> uh, it, I was decorated in 1969, and the very next day uh, was the uh, biennial Medal of Honor get together in Houston. So they, they flew us out to uh, to Houston, and that's where I met uh, Desmond Doss the day after I was decorated. And at the time, he was 20 years younger than I am now. And I thought he was the oldest guy who ever lived when I met him. Uh, and I knew him for 35 years until he died. Uh, I think you got him. You captured him. All the quiet power of Desmond Doss, quiet spoken power, I think you grabbed it. That's, that's Garfield. That, that kid is great. He, he did really, uh, um, I don't know which way it went. I don't know if Andrew sort of found Desmond or Desmond found him. I think there was a little of both going on. So, uh, because I think what a person does, um, whatever he does, good or bad, sort of clings to, to what he leaves behind. So Andrew picked up on that magically somehow and uh, was able to sort of portray that. How did you get involved in this project in the first place? You weren't out there mowing the lawn and then came up with the idea to do this. How did that work <laughs> No, it's mine and mine pick my nose. No, Bill Mechanic and David Perma, he's a producer has been riding this bronco for about 16 years, and they um, actually had given it to me 10 years earlier, and I didn't want to do it. And then, then they gave it to me again, and I sort of went, uh, but then the third time I looked at it, it just kind of got me. It went through here and up into my head, but... I saw it all of a sudden. I thought I could lend my talent to it, but uh, uh, so well, it was magnificent. I, I'm something of a scatterbrain, so every time you say something, I think of something else. <laughs> and remind me of some, some of the early earlier scenes. Vince, how did did you make up some of it? Was that ad libbed? A lot of that funny stuff, or a lot of it was in a script. Um, I had a really good writer, I think Andrew Knight, did a good pass of that with Mel. Um, and then <clears throat> Mel had some good ideas and gave those to me. And then some of it I did improvise. I had some ideas as well where I'd come with some things and say, well, what do you think of this? And kind of play around. But the, the foundation of it was in place um, for a large part of it. But uh, we always kind of kicked it around and see if we could come up with other things that made sense. Yeah, as you do too, you do scenes many, many times until you finally get the way you want to get it or what? Well, you do some sometimes. I mean, this one was a little bit unique because it was very ambitious the undertaking what Mel accomplished in the movie is really an independent film there wasn't a lot of backing so a lot of the battle stuff which is just spectacular was really rushed I mean the uh, battlefield itself was not that vast although t to see the movie it feels very much so but um, you know definitely we'd have time with some scenes to work and to do stuff with and I, don't know, I felt like maybe if there was more time there would have been more playing but it, it turned out for the best I, I think this is something people who are not in the business always want to know, and, and this is for all of you, but I'll ask Luke, how did, how did you prepare for the role? I mean, how did you get into it? I mean, it's, um, it's different for every actor. Every actor has a different process that way. Mel's obviously got his process for putting it together, but for me, there was a real, obviously, a physical aspect to it, and not just being physically prepared to run around the battlefield for 10 hours a day for two months, but... Also, that kind of idea that happens when you prepare for something physically, the mental training that goes into it. Um, but also, with my character, he's a, he's a tough guy on the surface, but as you see, he's, you know, he's got some stuff going on at the back, and I kind of delved into, at the base, you know, what is a man? Where does that come from? At what point does a man look into another man's eyes and go from saying toughen up to empathizing? You know, so, um, but for, for every actor, it's a little bit different. In, you know, including the roles and, and all those different parts, but but yeah, I mean, you just start at the base and build your way up. You know, there's a good place to start is the start. How hard did you have to work to dump the accent and sound like me? <laughs> Actually, I'm not that parrot, so like to start, like I can kind of hear something and kind of repeat it a bit. But um, no, I did spend about about eight weeks, kind of two three times a week with an accent coach. I also spent about 
a week and a half, two weeks living in Brooklyn, just walking around with the accent, listening to people, trying to become part of the community in that way. Um, but yeah, it takes a bit of work. You, you've got to get it to the point where when you open your mouth, you're not thinking about the sound. You're just thinking about the truth. So, um, yeah, it, it was about eight weeks or so of preparation. I read a lot of stuff. I listened to a lot of things, especially, you know, at the time as well. There's even cadence back then in those days. So, yeah, did it work that way. Vince, you, uh, you played other characters in many respects, not, not, not even similar to this, but in the same sort of vein. Did you, how did you prepare yourself for this? Well, I mean, this you knew you were playing a sergeant, so it was a bit of, I have some very good friends in the military. Um, I have a lot of family in the military as well. So I would, you know, call and just hear different people's thoughts of what their thought that was. And, you know, really just have the material and just kind of, you know, got your head around what the mission was, which was in this case very unique because you were going to take these kids over to, to battle. So. Your job is really to keep everyone alive, you know, um, form a unit, um, hopefully some real love and camaraderie with each other. Well, that comes through. I mean, there's no doubt about the, the love you feel for your, uh, I mean, you can see that even in the barracks scene at the very beginning. I mean, everybody who's been in the military knows that some drill sergeant kicks you in the head because he loves you. <laughs> in the end. In the end. Yeah, in the end. Um, both ends. Uh, but yeah, I mean, I think in this case, it's your responsibility. You're going to take it very personally. You want these kids to be alive. So sometimes with young people, you reach them with a little bit of humor, you know, you can drown them out. But you have to be tough as well. And, and then, of course, the nature of the story presented a very unique situation, which is this odd duck that's suggesting he won't carry a gun. So your thought process, is this guy even believe this? Is something he's sort of creating for other reasons? And then... It's kind of tragic, but it feels like he's sincere. But that's not a good fit for what we're going to do. So even though I can tell he's sincere, it doesn't seem to make a lot of sense. And there's a documentary and lots of good information about how the guys felt about it. But I think, you know, and Andrew Garfield, who can't be here, although I know he would really want to be here, was just did a tremendous job. He did, you know, you look at those early scenes with the love story and the innocence that he brought, and then ultimately the conviction and the strength that he had in the battle. Um, it was just, you know, very powerful. I, you know, I remember uh, Desmond and his wife were absolutely, totally inseparable. I mean, they were like, they were like glued together. They, they walked with four legs wherever they went. It was like, it was like a kid's soccer game, you know, you know where the ball is. And that's the, the way the two of them were like. And that's the way you had them look. They were, uh, I think you captured them both. How long did the project take from start to finish? Well, you know, you have pre-production, which is, of course, like three months of preparation and looking at casting and making sure you got all the cameras and, you know, everybody and the logistics, all the different departments bringing them together, the set design, the special effects, you know what your budget is, and then you find out that you have 59 days to shoot it, <laughs> which killed me, and, um, and, and not enough money. So we went like the horses from hell to get, to get it, and um, fortunately for me, I had really good people around me to help me get it. All the different departments did their thing. Logistically speaking, the battles, I think, and I don't even know how long we had. It was maybe, I don't know, maybe like 25 days just to do all three of those. Uh, so it's, yeah. I was marveled at what we would have that day and how we even got through it. Yeah, the battlefield was only 100 meters by... Where was it? Where was it? In the middle of a dairy farm in Australia. Celebrity <laughs> <laughs> combat scene. Those cows are dangerous. <laughs> Especially when you haven't milked them. <laughs> One of the technical things that's unique is you couldn't shoot 360. You would see farmhouses behind where you were shooting. So you actually see how Mel's eye works, that he could create that landscape in the way that he did is absolutely remarkable. All about Marks and Angles. Oh, yeah. those guys, Marks and Angles. <laughs> we won't talk about them here. <laughs> get your Marks and get your Angles. Very well. Did, was there any time during this whole process that you, not that your enthusiasm flagged, but you thought it just wasn't going to, you weren't going to be able to get to the end? Well, yeah, you go through that with everything. It's just like being dropped in the ocean with this stuff. You just start swimming, you're bound to hit land sooner or later. And, you end up with what you end up with. A film largely makes itself. 
But that's not true either because you know the camera has a brain, but then there's all those various personalities and departments that have to be synchronized to come together. It's like a pathway away. And you're sort of handing out orders and, and you delegate stuff and everybody does their bit. This is a very cohesive unit. Great. Ozzy Film Cruiser. So there's all the talent and they're great. Oh, I, I got a question for you, Luke. I, uh, how did you wind up getting the part? I mean, is it something you saw it, your agent come and try to grab you and thought you were right for it, you know, read for it or what? Yeah, I kind of um, uh, got sent the script. Uh, I read it, put it down and said, uh, yeah, I'll play a tree in this movie. <laughs> and if they don't give me a tree, I'll play a rock. I just wanted to be a part of it, knowing that Mel was at the helm and, <clears throat> and the undeniable power of the story. You just want to be a part of something in, like this in your career. And I feel very fortunate that I am. But then uh, a couple of months go by and you keep asking the agency if you can do an audition or what's going on with it. And eventually I put down a little self-tape and um, I was supposed to meet Mel actually, we were supposed to sit down. I got terribly sick and I literally waited until the morning of that thing and I, and I had to cancel it because I couldn't get out of bed. And I thought I'd blown it, I was depressed for about two, three days. Just, I, I couldn't believe I'd lost this opportunity in a way. And then my phone rang and I answered it and I said, hello, and you went, look, it's Mel. I went, Gibson? <laughs> yeah. Not Mel, the milk man. <laughs> I didn't know any other Mel. But we, we ended up having a chat for 45 minutes for an hour, and, and it just morphed into kind of, I have a deep fascination with World War II and history and stuff like that, so we just ended up talking about different things we'd seen in documentaries and what we'd learn about and all these different stuff, and at the end of the conversation, Mel goes, all right, well, I'll see you in Sydney. I went, oh, I think I got the job. <laughs> I hung up and I called my manager and my agent and I said, this just happened. I was, I was over the moon and uh, was kind of floating around for a week or so and then I thought, no, I better get to work. And yeah, spent two months kind of getting ready and head on down to Sydney and, and was just, yeah, been pinching myself ever since. Hey, Vince, I got a question for you, Vince. You've been around the block more than two or three times. <laughs> five, five times to be exact. <laughs> You look 20 years older than I do now, actually. <laughs> but we're, not, we're not talking about how we carry ourselves, we're talking about gold. I used to be much taller, actually. You know. And I don't know how guys your size manage to survive combat. If I were about that big, I'd be very happy in combat. I'd try to get as small as I can. But you've, you've worked for a long, long time. Do you find that sometimes you're shooting a scene and the boss thinks that it's that's great and that's the end of it but you're not satisfied with it does that happen from time to time and you, can you convince the director to shoot uh, try it a couple more different ways well i think there's times where you, you think there's something else there or you know um sometimes you feel like you've gotten it and they want something else that's that's the nature of um collaborating but in a situation like this when you have someone like mel who's made so many fantastic movies that Apocalypto movie was on a whole other level I, I couldn't even it's like a you know pioneering movie and of course Braveheart and Passion just incredible so and he's also such a tremendous film actor an incredible actor as well that you felt very confident when he said I've got it um, but he, he had a great nature we would play around we would bounce ideas he would give me good thoughts very fun set you know as far as um, the environment that was created for us within the context of the scenes. But um, yeah, if I ever said to him, hey, I really have a strong feeling, can I try something? He would say, sure, go ahead, if, if time was permitting. But um, no, on this one, I felt like we were all very much in sync, and everyone was really committed to, you know, this is being a true story, and the message of the film, it felt very, you know, I think everyone was really committed to giving their best. Um, and. And I also think with Mel and the way that he conducts himself and with the skill level that he has, it, it, was, it was more fun than it was anything else. Absolutely. Uh, let me ask you something, Mel, because you're the artist. I mean, the, the overall artist here. When somebody... Well, I'm not an artist. <laughs> uh, when, when, when a sculptor is going to carve something, I, I remember this old gag about a guy who was from uh, New York City or Washington, D.C., up in the riding down the woods of Maine and he looks up and sees uh, some old guy on a porch and he's carving a horse out of a big log and it looks just like a horse. He rides up there and he says, uh, how do you do that? And he says, well, um, I just 
cut away all the stuff that doesn't look like a horse. Now, when, do, you, do you have a vision of what this thing is going to look like at the very beginning or some short time into the project? You know what it's going to look like. Yeah, it, a lot of it comes, you know, some, some key images come and then they come sporadically, and but usually as you're going to sleep at night, you get these angles and ideas and very strong visuals, and I'm pretty visual. And uh, um, I kind of know what I want by the time I get into it. I do minimal storyboards, and then I allow for other people who may have better vision, like some of the camera guys, to sort of, you know, strut their stuff as well, and I'm not proud, I'll steal it. So it's like, uh, whatever we can get to make this thing dynamic. I mean, there's a shot that one, one of my sons was one of the camera guys on this. He's like 30 years old, and he can have a 90 pound steady cam around and follow people. He can carry me around, yeah. <laughs> and, and, yeah. And um, uh, he got some amazing images, but like sometimes it's better than, than what you imagine, which is really nice, because, man, everybody's a, a working member of pretty good <coughs> idea. If the craft service guy comes up with a good idea, I want to hear it. So it's, um, uh, but by and large, you go into it with a with a notion of the rhythms of it. You know, you. I wanted, you know, when they landed in Okinawa, it wasn't like a big beach landing. They lobbed in, and it was like, oh, we're going to take it. But it turned out to be like the worst battle in the Pacific. That's yeah, it was the worst battle. battle. We we had more casualties in on Okinawa than we had in any other battle. Yeah, so they were tough. It was tough. And you know, you know that they used a lot of napalm, so you had to get into that with the flamethrowers and a lot of bombs and get them out of caves. And uh, and the Japanese called it a steel rain because of all the bullets and steel that were flying around. So you know, we had to. I, I tried to emulate that in a, in a short amount of time. And um, so you, you get a pretty good idea. No, I think it came out great. I like your use of hand grenades. I firmly, I'm here to testify that. Uh, it's the best closing weapon you can possibly have. And since I've, I'm a lousy shot, I'm much better with the area. Well, they, they work very well indeed. I read about the Medal of Honor guy who he ran out. Uh, he didn't have grenades. He didn't have bullets. He ran out of everything. He just had a box full of mortars. And he wiped out of, like companies of Japanese just by like banging them and just throwing them like footballs out of America. Yeah, we, we talked about that. Well, I mean, we talked about that. We thought actually. We did, we we had heard, heard the same story actually. Like, anything you could invent uh, took place. I one, one there's a recipient uh, now gone, Lou Millet, who uh, led the last documented bayonet charge in American military history in Korea, and. Uh, the guy Mitchell Page, and I knew these guys, and so did Desmond. Mitchell Page, who uh, who used an entrenching tool to wipe out the better part of a Japanese platoon wow. as a Marine. So anything, you can't make it up. You can't, whatever it is, however outrageous you think you can make it, you can't make it up. Yeah, the truth is always weird. The truth is always stranger than fiction. Well, I can't thank you enough. I, I've got some presents for you. Because you've given us something that's very, very uh, precious, and I hope it does extremely well, as I'm sure it will. I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a noble piece of work. Um, I'm uh, co-chair of the Medal of Honor Foundation, uh, which supports the Medal of Honor Society, which includes all the living recipients of the Medal of Honor. And some years ago, we came to the conclusion that we were wasting asset and. Um, what we really needed to do is reach into the future because we're not going to be here forever. Laughing. We want to do our best as long as we're alive to inculcate the next generation with these ideas uh, which, which save the country and save the world, as you show in, in the movie. Uh, one of the things we did was produce this book, Medal of Honor Portraits of Valor available at fine bookstores everywhere. <laughs> um, it's a great coffee table book and it's like in its 17th printing. And it's got uh, photographic portraits of all the Medal of Honor recipients alive at the time we shot it. He's, uh, and, and, their, uh, and their bios. And interestingly, the guy who wrote all the copy, uh, a guy named Peter Collier, was a communist in the, during the war in Vietnam and decided that he made a few mistakes in doing that and wrote all of this copy, all the bios for free. Um, 
Uh, Desmond Doss is in there. I'm in there. I have signed them, which reduces their value dramatically. The <laughs> <laughs> Antiques Roadshow, he, he said, wow, this would be worth $20 million if Jacobs had been scribbled in it. <laughs> I want to give each one of you a, a copy of, of this so that, um, not that you're going to forget this, you'll never forget, and we won't either, but that you'll remember tonight. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.